Well, hello and welcome. Uh, I am resuming my solo presentation of the review of Samantha Markle's book, which is this. And uh, so shall we just plunge right in? Mickey is going to help me, aren't you, Mickey? Mickey, say hello. Say hello to everybody. Say hello. Kissy boos, kissy boos. Have you been enjoying Mutty reading this book? Yes, you have. Yes, you have. Good girl. Okay, so we plunge right in. More or less, I would estimate at where we left off the other day. So, on page 197, there is a very interesting passage about the death of Grandma Markle, who was a revered figure in the Markle family. And Megan has written quite extensively about what a revered figure Grandma Markle was. And we will get to that in a little while about her inconsistencies and her false memories. Uh, but in the, uh, on page 197, Samantha addresses the issue of Grandma Markle's death. And she makes it absolutely clear that Megan's later claims that she had a very distant relationship with her family is completely fallacious because not only did Megan have a close relationship with her family, but she even went to great pains on the TIG and in other sources to point out what a close relationship she had with Grandma Markle. Later on in the book, she, Samantha alights upon the inconsistency, shall we say, that Megan creates when she states that uh, she had such a wonderful relationship with Grandma Markle that she called her our queen and that she remembers making jam of some description with Grandma Markle, except, as Samantha points out, Grandma Markle's jam making days were long behind her when Megan was growing up, because Megan was born in 1981 and Grandma Markle stopped making jam in the 1970s because she moved from up north to down south and thereafter she never made jam again. So this is just one of the really rather interesting little inconsistencies that, that Megan is prone to that is picked up. Let's fast forward to page 207. Megan has claimed repeatedly, including in that infamous letter that she wrote to her father, that she barely knew Samantha and had only met her twice in her life, etc., uh, etc. Et well, there is an absolute refutation of this, not only throughout the whole of the book, but in one particular where on page 207, Samantha writes, the last time I had spoken with my sister was when I called her at her apartment in Canada in December 2015, almost 2016. It seemed as though she was excited to hear from me. It was seldom that I could actually reach her because of our completely different schedules but she was still traveling as an ambassador for suits. I was really worried 
about our father because he could sometimes become reclusive depending on his schedule. The point that I make with this is that it is yet again a refutation of Megan's claim that she had no family, that she barely knew them, that she wasn't in contact with them, that she was really often Annie rescued by the wonderful royal family, if we remember. There was that marvelous moment, uh, that first Christmas that she spent at Sandringham, when Harry announced to the world that Meghan had finally got the family that she had never had. This, of course, was just before, well, this relatively soon before. I mean, I don't think two years is that long. It, in, at my age, two years is relatively soon. So relatively soon before she jettisoned the royal family as well, because, of course, rather like her own birth family, both branches. Uh, and Samantha does make the claim that she has jettisoned not only the Markle family, but the Raglan family as well. And she just jettisoned the royal family as well, because I suppose when you're a goddess, you don't really need human families. I mean, what are ordinary families? I mean, with ordinary people? For someone as special as moi? <laughs> I think not. It's just not worth the effort, you know, to have to grab down there with all of the ordinary people. <laughs> and ordinary people very quickly became the royal family as well. <laughs> anyway, uh, on page 208, Meghan touches upon the fact that she was hoping that now Meghan was making good money in suits, that she would actually take some steps towards repaying her father some of the considerable sums of money he spent on her education. Samantha claims that the education, the university education, cost a million dollars. Well, I think her math might be slightly out, but whatever it cost, it cost several hundred thousand dollars. And I think Samantha does make a point that I, if I recall correctly, I made in my book that people made to me, that you have to be particularly mean and self-centered to be making tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars and you are too mean to offer your father who has wiped himself out financially to educate you when he is struggling. Samantha makes the point and that she, she makes the point on more than one occasion in the book. On this occasion she says that she didn't really press Megan on the issue, but there is another part in the book where she does press Megan on the issue, and Megan informs her that there are really too many cooks in this kitchen sort of thing, and that she'd better mind her own business because it's nothing to do with her, which I suppose is one way of looking at it, although I would have thought that if you're a loving daughter, you would want to do it. And if a loving other daughter suggested that you should do it, maybe you could actually consider doing it instead of spending more on a dress than you would be able to spend to buy your father a new car. I just make that point for what it's worth. On page 211, there are some rather interesting revelations. The first one is that there was a definite overlap according to what 
Samantha's calculations are with regard to her, their father's information as to when he found out that Meghan was dating a prince. She didn't say she was dating Harry. She said she was dating a prince. And Samantha rather acerbically picks her up on that comment. Well, I can sort of understand why she picks her up on the comment because Meghan's behavior has engendered a lot of bitterness within the family and actually within the world at large. And I suppose Samantha is not going to let an opportunity slip by to put the boot in. And who can blame her uh, after the way Meghan humiliated the whole of her family? But we'll get to that. Anyway, she makes the point that Meghan was seeing Corrie when she met Harry and that there was overlap. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong in a girl riding two horses at the same time. And, you know, you're going to see which one suits you better, I suppose. But uh, it certainly does suggest that our Megs are uh, was not completely unentangled. I mean, this could actually be erroneous, but it could also. And Corrie has been at great pains over the period to refuse to point out when he and Meghan broke up, which of course is very decent of him. Anyway, onwards and upwards, as they say. Samantha now alights upon a very, very important part of what became the Markle debacle, which is how the press got the family involved in such a way that they had everybody at everybody else's throat and that they twisted and turned absolutely everything anybody had to say, including Samantha. Well, I can tell you of my own personal experience that and Samantha's description of the way the press waded in on the whole family and asked various questions, twisted what she said, amplified it a thousand times, not only in terms of repetition in various organs of the press, but also in exaggerating the content of what she had said. I know that to be true because it's happened to me, it's happened to absolutely every body that I know of who has been involved with the press. It's par for the course and goes along with the territory. And Samantha goes to some pains throughout to let people know that she would say, for instance, she, she mentions something about, she didn't say that her sister was pushy, she said uh, that Meghan was ice along the lines of very proactive and the press interpreted that quite accurately as saying that Meghan was pushy. Uh, and she was also asked a question about how would the Queen feel about some rather awkward situation to do with Meghan. And she rather unguardedly and ill-advisedly said the Queen would be appalled, little realizing the enormity of a comment like that in the print medium. And I have to say, I'm often warning people. I have to say, from my own experience, I know 
how the press can twist and turn. And I have often had to say to people, whether it's my children or somebody close to me, whenever the press have been around and they're going to, I say, don't say that because you need to consider how things will look in print. And you must never, 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 ever, ever, ever say anything that is a joke in the press. Because you say something as a joke today, in this situation, tomorrow it's no longer a joke, it's serious. The press have printed it without the context and it is particularly damning, which is of course exactly what happened with Samantha and her really rather witty comment, the Queen would be appalled. She had no idea that it was going to come back to bite her the way it is. She then, later on in the book, because I have to tell you the book chops and changes in the most amazing way, it meanders, it's like a snake of a river. Uh, so you leave a subject, two pages later you come back to it, twelve pages later you're back to it again. But Samantha does make the point that time and again uh, Meghan hung them all out to dry and when they tried to get in touch with Meghan to say to Meghan, you know, we are being hung out to dry, we are being hung out to dry, we are, have, have not said some of the things that we are quoted as saying, absolute silence, absolute silence. To, to such an extent that the family confabbed as to whether there was a royal protocol involved and they ultimately began to realise there was no royal protocol. Meghan simply couldn't be bothered to get in touch with the family and protect the family. And indeed, Samantha alights upon a very interesting point, which is in the early days, the British press were quite determined to make her look as good as possible at the expense of her family. Now, this is a standard ploy with the British press, especially the tabloids. Fairy at the top of the Christmas tree, evil stepmother beautifully dressed halfway down the Christmas tree. And they beat that poor little ornament for all it's worth. And they did this without a doubt. They did this time and time again in the early days. And Samantha quite rightly says that they ultimately realized that the press was throwing the family, the Markle family, not the Raglan family, because they couldn't throw the Raglan family under the bus. They could only throw the Markle family under the bus because the Markle family was white and the Raglan family being people of color were off limits. But the awful family was an absolute foil to boost Meghan even higher and to make Meghan look better than she was there. But what I actually think that Samantha does not realize, in fact, is that there was another dynamic going on here, which was they realized that the Markles were garrulous, could, could be easily, whatever they said, twisted and turned. And the press were deliberately setting up a conflict situation between Meghan and her family in the hope that the family would fall out and that the family would begin to address issues that they, the press, knew about, but were too timid and timorous and careful of their pockets and their reputations to address. They were hoping that they would have had the Markle family spill the beans. And in fairness to them, there are beans that they have never spilled much to the frustration of the press. But of course, now that Meghan 
and Harry have turned on the press. The press aren't quite so eager to rubbish her father's family anymore. However, they have found themselves in a cul-de-sac because having rubbished the Markle family and they don't really have the courage to actually reveal entirely what goes on behind the scenes and what some of the unpalatable truths are, there's still a gap between perception and reality. So, next bit. On page 215, Samantha alights upon how perplexed her whole family was by Meghan's silence and the silence from the palace. And they actually thought, is this royal protocol? Uh, and they were trying to figure out what was really going on. It's only later on that she realized that, in fact, it wasn't royal protocol. It was Meghan who was fudging the issues, and Meghan who was freezing them out, and Meghan who was not coming to their rescue, and Meghan who was allowing them to look bad, badly in English, but contemporary vernacular bad. <laughs> so on to the next bit. On page 122, Samantha now begins to see the light of day where the press and her sister are concerned. She says, what was so shocking was that the articles were often untrue and were skewed for the sake of sensationalization. To continue the theme, on page 228, because if I don't have some order in this, uh, I'll be chopping and changing and you will be just driven crazy. So on page 228, the theme continues when she alights upon the fact that the promotion of Meg as a humanitarian was a deliberate ploy of the palace and the press to make Meghan look good. However, she says, this was in absolute contrast to the way Meghan was treating the family. She then goes on to, she then at some point, and I'll try to do things in a little bit more topical way than it's done in the book. She then explains an incident where she phones Megan and Megan answers and she says, hi Meg, it's me. And Megan, and she thinks she hears Doria in the background and there's a commotion in the background. Megan hangs up the phone on her and never accepts another call from her. Uh, Megan has now iced her. Uh, Megan is asked by the family to provide them with guidance in the early days through the father as to how to deal with the press. On page 223, Samantha shows how naive she really still is when she states that she was telling the press how much she loved her sister, but she wasn't comparable to Diana, uh, and then complains to the press about the fact that Meghan is not treating the family with the consideration that they deserve, that she is icing them, and that she 
is allowing the press to embark upon really a latter-day version of the Salem witch hunt using the markles as the witches. Well, of course, that was incredibly naive of Samantha. Uh, and I think Thomas Markle, the father, also started to, after the wedding, to use the only access that they had to Meghan was through the press. And they started to hope to reach Meghan by complaining about their dissatisfactions, which of course only exacerbated things. But what actually comes across as you keep on reading this book is how cold and callous Meghan was in the way she treated the family that had given her love and support all her life and had continued to do it throughout the whole of her life until she realized ooh, she was in spitting distance of becoming a member of the British royal family, at which point the whole lot of them, they were just erased, like the way at school, remember, on blackboards, old-fashioned blackboards, you take out the eraser and the master or the mistress would go psh, 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 and all of a sudden all of the work had disappeared. Well, I think we sort of get that picture with Megsy Baby. There's a rather touching scene on page 224 about Harry renting a house in Beverly Hills and catering, fully laid on everything, caterers, staff, the whole nine yards, for a Thanksgiving luncheon for Meghan, Thomas Markle Sr., and Doria, but no mention of Samantha, Thomas Jr., any of the other Raglans, any of the cousins, no mention of anybody at all, because Doria's stated objective within the family, and this was while she and Thomas were married and obviously carried through even until after their divorce, was that when the three of them were together, they were the three cherubs. I'm amazed that the three cherubs didn't actually graduate into being the Holy Trinity. But there we go, I suppose they are modest people and therefore there is no possibility of them graduating from the three cherubs. But what's really interesting to me is how Doria's influence, if Samantha is to be believed, prevailed and that Meghan was so absolutely willing and in fact proactive in following her mother's exclusionary agenda. Now, I actually agree with Samantha that the reason is that Doria knows how to keep her mouth shut and the Markles don't. <laughs> However, I also have to say, she thinks it was uh, very considerate of Harry to hire a house for the three of them to have a Thanksgiving uh, celebration. I actually think it's really rather tacky. I mean, honestly, hiring a house for Thanksgiving, for any celebration of that nature. I mean, it's not a wedding. You know, you're hiring a whole house. Oh, what's wrong with their houses? I mean, why do they have to be so pifflingly pretentious that they need to be in a grand house? 
What's wrong with their houses? I mean, a house is a house is a house, I would have thought. But then again, I suppose I'm rather more down to earth than they are. So, on page 227, and this is really worth quoting, Samantha goes into the fluctuating feelings that she and the family endure as the whole business of the Markle debacle unfolds in front of the world. She says, she, the, the, he, the, the chapter heading is the Markle Circus Performers. I had enough of the media news about my sister dating Harry and I was worried about Trevor. The way she rudely mailed his rings back to him rather than being a compassionate adult and speaking with him in person was very representative of her regard for people in general, in my opinion. I fluctuated in my feelings of protectiveness as it became evident that she was avoiding doing the right thing by family and by others. On November the 27th, 2017, news broke around the world that Meg and Harry were engaged. I had a knee-jerk reaction to call Dad because I knew I would have mixed feelings. I wanted him to be happy and I was hoping that somehow he could be a part of a fairy tale wearing his little Meg, grew up, married a prince, lived in a castle, and everyone would live happily ever after. The banter and fanaticism began chaotically stirring on the internet. And even within our family, there was a nervousness that was like something out of the twilight zone. The media began provoking family members and pitting us against each other by creating false stories and forcing us to react quickly back and forth like a psychotic racquetball game. Everyone in the family was at each other's throats, but what was most interesting was that rather than calling each other to find out what was said and what was not said, mudslinging was the reflex rather than open communication and extending the benefit of the doubt. I was publicly flogged for honestly speaking my mind and no one in the family had the nerve yet to step out of the ant line. Every fairy tale had to have a villain, and I guess they picked me to be just that. Some of us in the family were speaking to each other, and others were still sucking up to media, giving interviews what they wanted to hear, which involved disparaging me. And she goes on and on and on. To the next interesting point, which was, the one thing everyone wanted to know in the public and within the family was who got an invitation. If anyone did, we waited and as the days passed by, reality settled in like an atomic blast when none of us got one. And it was obvious that none of us would get an invitation. Out of respect and traditional inclusion of family, Meg could have mailed invitations. I wouldn't complain, but it was reported that more than 300 invitations would go out to complete strangers in the public. It was glaring that the issue was not a matter of inviting people based on how close they were or were not, because strangers were not close at all. She then goes on, and this is really important because this gets to the heart of the matter. Because of that, it was even more hurtful that neither the Raglans nor the Markles were invited to the wedding. This was an incredible insult to our family, who had peers and colleagues and friends in our communities, criticizing us for not receiving an invitation. Uncles, cousins, everyone in the family and even people on the fringe of the family who had no business expecting invitations were now questioning why they 
had not been invited. The most insulting part of it all was that in the eyes of the world, people were scrutinizing and seemingly shaming us as though we had to be flawed for not receiving invitations. The, invi the absence of the invitation was as socially stigmatizing as a scarlet letter. And there we have the crux of the matter. The royal family knew how embarrassing it would be for Meghan's family to not be asked to the wedding. My understanding is that they suggested that the family be asked and Meghan is the one who point blank refused to have any of the family there. She also, it emerges, never ever sent her father an invitation. And in fact, I will come to this a little bit later, but she used rather cleverly the absence of an invitation to unsettle her father entirely. Now, how did the royal family know how embarrassing it is that no member of the Markle and Raglan families, with the exception of her mother and father, had been asked? Because Prince Philip's four sisters, three sisters, sorry, one was dead. Prince Philip's three sisters were not asked to his wedding and they found it mortifying. He understood they found it mortifying. He would never have had a situation like that replicate itself willingly. So that is a very interesting point to alight upon. So we now get to Megan playing games. And Samantha says, I was in shock when I found out that not only had she not called me on purpose, but that she was playing games with our father. And what were the games that she was playing? She told Thomas Markle, and this Samantha got from their father, that he could not attend her wedding. She told their father that he would not be allowed to attend her wedding unless he abandoned his two elder children and she had to have known that her father would never have made that choice. And this explains an awful, awful lot. It explains why Thomas Markle hadn't been measured for a suit. She, it explains why Thomas Markle was against royal precedent, not given a coat of arms, which is customary for the in-laws who marry into the royal family and do not have their own coat of arms. She also, and this is truly disturbing, the photographer, the journalist, who got in touch with the Markles and suggested cleaning up Thomas's image in the saga of the staged photographs that took, if you recall, uh, the week before the wedding, he was exposed as having posed for photographs. It emerges that that journalist was somebody who knew Megan. <laughs> 
Now, I'm not accusing Megan of having orchestrated that situation, believe me. But it's quite clear that Sananza believes that Megan orchestrated the situation. Uh, and that she was actually going to throw her father to the wolves one way or the other. And she was going to make absolutely sure that garrulous old Thomas Marcus Sr. was nowhere near Prince Harry. And he's never been anywhere near Prince Harry. Now, that, I have to say, is truly brilliant. If Samantha's suspicions are accurate, and I will repeat for legal reasons, I am not for one second, not even a nano, mini, mini, mini nanosecond, uh, trying to imply that Meghan did any such thing and that Meghan was behind the whole scenario that made her father look like such, <laughs> I mean, just ridiculous, ridiculous the way uh, they ended up making the poor man look. But isn't it telling that Samantha believes that her sister was behind it and that her sister made absolutely sure, one way or the other, that their father would not attend that wedding? And I will close this review with the observation that Thomas Markle, by Meghan's own account, was a wonderful father. Thomas Markle, Thomas Markle, as everybody knows, is an ill man. He's not a well man, he's an ill man. Even a well person subjected to the bombardment that Thomas Markle was subjected to, not only by the press and the gutter press, but by the family and by his daughter Meghan pressing his buttons if Samantha can be believed, uh, setting up situations where her father, akin to King Lear, is going to have to uh, make choices that are just impossible for any decent person to make. The picture Samantha Markle paints of her sister is of a Shakespearean character that could have stepped straight out of King Lear or Macbeth. And that, I have to say, I find truly frightening. It also has to be said that Meghan has been extremely resourceful in entertaining us, whether we wish to be entertained or not by her. Look at me, look at me. Oh. Two weeks pregnant, two weeks pregnant, two weeks pregnant. Look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm one half of the most fabulously loving couple on the face of the earth. Look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm everybody's victim. Look at me, look at me, look at me. This poor woman of colour. This poor mixed race woman. Having been abused by a whole racist nation. It is too dreadful. It's unsurvivable, the torment that I have been put through. But look at me, look at me, look at me. Oh, look at me, look at me, look at me. The woman is an absolute genius at grabbing attention. Where it is all going to end is going to be very interesting. But I would be very surprised. The more this drama 
unfolds. It's the more surprised I will be if it ends in anything but disaster. But we will see, because nobody can live at this fever pitch of activity and sensationalism and drama on a daily basis without something giving. And I know I, like many people, are dying for the wheel to stop spinning. And on that note, I will say thank you very much for listening. I hope you have enjoyed this. Uh, I seem to recall of what Misha does. I think I should say, please like, subscribe, and something else. I've forgotten what he says, even though I've heard it over a hundred times. I'm sorry. Anyway, if you would please do whatever needs to be done. <laughs> Thank you very much. And keep the questions coming in. God bless you. And Mickey sends to say goodbye as well. Thank you.